Good evening um, or morning to those in Hong Kong, and thank you all for joining us. <clears throat> I am Sebastian Burka, the acting director of the Stigler Center, and uh, today we are happy to host Mr. Benny Tai and Professor Stephen Davis for the final webinar in our series, Freedom of Speech, Hong Kong, and the Future of US-China Relations. The series was created to facilitate conversations among leading scholars and experts about the implications of the ongoing events in Hong Kong for freedom of speech, US-China relations, and beyond. Before we begin, please note that we are on the record and we will post the video on the Stigler Center YouTube channel later. If you have questions for the speakers, we will address them in the last 15 minutes or so, and you can submit them via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. As usual, views expressed by guests are their own, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. We hope that you will join us for more upcoming webinars in the winter quarter. So please check our website, um, our publication, promarket.org, and our Capitalism to Podcast, hosted by Luigi Zingales and Bethany McLean. And back to today, you have more information on our speakers on the event page, but please allow me to briefly introduce them. Benny Tai is a legal scholar and former associate professor of law at the University of Hong Kong. He is also a co-founder of the 2014 Occupy Central Movement. And our moderator, Stephen Davis, is the William Abbott Distinguished Service Professor of International Business and Economics at Chicago Booth. And we thank him for his invaluable contribution to this series. Without further ado, I now turn it over to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And uh, thanks to the Stigler Center for hosting this. And especially, uh, Benny, thank, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to speak with you. Um, let me give some background uh, for the benefit of our audience, um, a little bit more than Sebastian gave. So you are a Hong Kong native, a legal scholar, and a pro-democracy activist. Uh, in December 1984, while you were a law school student at Hong Kong University, the United Kingdom and China agreed to transfer sovereignty of Hong Kong uh, to China, effective July 1997. In 1985, you were elected as a student representative on the consultative committee of Hong Kong's basic law. You also assisted Martin Lee, who served on the basic law drafting committee and is widely known as the father of Hong Kong's democracy. So you've kind of been there from the beginning, at least the post handover beginning. In 2014, as Sebastian men mentioned, you co-founded Occupy Central with Love and Peace, love the name, a civil disobedience campaign that pressed for greater democracy in Hong Kong. Uh, that campaign grew into the Umbrella Movement or the Occupy Central Movement, a series of mass protests that went on for uh, about three and a half months or so. In April 2019, so just last year, you were convicted of conspiracy to cause public nuisance and for inciting others to cause public nuisance in connection with your role in the 2014 pro-democracy protests. You served four months of that sentence and are now out on, out on bail, out from prison on bail, uh, awaiting appeal. And you were until recently a tenured professor of law at Hong Kong University. Um, five months ago, after 20 years on the faculty and against the recommendation of the faculty senate, you were fired by the Hong Kong University Governing Council. Uh, ostensibly for your conviction. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, I think, later. And you are now an independent legal scholar. So first, Benny, did I, did I misstate any facts? Or is there anything else that you'd like to put on the table before, before we jump into the, um, the particulars here? Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Actually, that's quite comprehensive of uh, things I've done in my life. <laughs> well, that's, that's, no, that's only a, I've only, I've only, in on a small fraction, you, you, you've been a busy guy for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So Benny, um, you know, you are a, you're an expert on the rule of law. That's one of the areas you study. And I, I would like to ask you to first give us mm -hmm. uh, your preferred definition of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just put it in a very simple way that uh, the rule of law we are talking about is not just that uh, a place have laws and all the rules there, but we have to ask what actually is the purpose of having law in the society. 
that for rule of law, the law need to be able to impose constraints on governmental powers, effective constraints on the governmental powers. And also the law needs to be used to protect people's fundamental rights. That's what I, I refer to uh, the rule of law. And that is the rule of law that has been practiced in Hong Kong uh, before the transfer of sovereignty and for some years after the transfer of sovereignty. Though we are now facing a situation that uh, I call it the death of the rule of law, that the rule of law, even it might be called rule of law, but it's no longer that kind of rule of law that we embrace for, for years. Yeah, so, so when you say constraints on government power, I guess in the US we, we think of things like checks and balances within the government, separation of powers, an independent judiciary uh, yep. and the like. And that's, yep, that's they're all included, they're all included, yeah. Yes, and you, know, you mentioned that, yes, you still have laws in Hong Kong and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Hong Kong government and even the Beijing authorities pay lip service to rule of law, um, but they, they, they seem to mean something rather different. Can you elaborate on, on their, their conception of the rule of law and how it contrasts to the definition you just gave? Yeah, I um, borrow the term from uh, other scholars. I call the existing form of so-called rule of law in Hong Kong authoritarian rule of law. Now you have laws, but the law will be will will, will grant uh, powers to a particular institution um, to exercise um, or, or to the power to make decisions and uh, through a certain procedure. On the contrary, there's some procedures to have to be gone through. Then the, the things past it will be called law. And what law can grant such authorization and what procedure need to be go through will be all defined by that particular institution. And in the Hong Kong context, that is the, we call it the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, which is a political organization in mainland China. So um, recently, the uh, Standing Committee has made various decisions that have very wide implication to the governing of Hong Kong, including delaying the election, uh, disqualifying legislators, and all these, um, um, they make a decision. And that decision says that it has the power to make that decision. And it just defines what procedures it needs to go through. And then the decision so-called made will have the authority in Hong Kong and cannot even be questioned by our courts. So that is the kind of rule of law we are having. So there, there's, no, there's no check yeah, on the ability no of the National Congress and the PRC to make laws and impose them on Hong Kong. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, it's uh, according to my understanding rule of law that the law should protect the fundamental rights of the people. Okay. But that yeah. this, the decisions make actually infringe the uh, political rights of Hong Kong people. Yeah, so that was another element of your, your, your initial definition of the rule of law. It's not only about constraints on the government, but protecting certain fundamental rights. Yes, right. right, and, right. and there's there's no system in place in Hong Kong or in mainland China for that matter, as I understand it, to protect those fundamental rights. Um, there may begin, there may be there may be laws that say they're protected, but there's really nothing to protect those yep. rights in the face of a decision by the, by the Beijing authorities, in, in this case, represented by the National Congress. Is that right? Yeah, actually, there's no, no way that we can challenge the, or question the decision of the standing committee, as I've mentioned, the several decisions made recently. And um, that's, the Hong Kong courts has no power, no authority to uh, review those decisions. And also there's no procedure, no process within the mainland China system for people to uh, challenge the authority of that, of those decisions made by the standing committee. So in a word that the standing committee itself enjoys unlimited power. Yes, okay. So there's, there's no analog in mainland China to what the Supreme Court in the United States, it's power to decide yeah. what's constitutional and what's not. And there's certainly no authority in inside Hong Kong to make those decisions with respect to laws yeah. that are imposed upon it by the National Congress. Now, in, you know, you have a new article or a forthcoming article that has the same hopeful title as this event, The Rebirth of Hong Kong's Rule of Law. 
And um, you, one thing you discussed in that article, which I found quite interesting, is um, challenges to the rule of law, mm -hmm. as you defined it, emerged pretty early on um, yeah. after the handover uh, of Hong Kong in 1997. And there's, there's two episodes you mentioned, which I'd, I'd like to get, you know, get a, a brief thumbnail description of you from you and, and then you know, draw the lessons for what they meant for the path of the rule of law in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So one involved the, the right of abode for the children of Hong Kong residents born in mainland China. Mm. Might seem like a you know, small issue. Um, the other, and that was in 1999, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. The other involved a unilateral decision by Beijing mm. um, to postpone the introduction of universal suffrage mm. to 2017. So describe those two episodes and, and what they revealed about Beijing's view Mm -hmm. as to how the basic law would function uh, in Hong Kong. Well, let me talk about the first event, that is the uh, rights of uh, people born in mainland China and whether they have the right to uh, stay, come to Hong Kong and stay in Hong Kong. Now, uh, that may not seem to be a big issue, but actually um, that means a huge influx of, uh, that might be a huge influx of immigrants from mainland China into Hong Kong. We're going to be talking about a million more people. Hong Kong has only a 7 million population. Now, at that time, um, those children, they applied to the court to uh, challenge the uh, immigration laws that prohibit their coming. But on the basis of the basic law, the provisions of our constitution, they should have the rights. So our court of final appeal, that's the highest court in Hong Kong, ruled in favor of them. But the chief executive, that is like the president of Hong Kong, um, applied to the standing committee of the National People's Congress to seek for a reinterpretation of the relevant provisions of the basic law, which the court has already made a ruling on that. And in effect, that interpretation overturned the decision of the uh, court's decision. So I think that's the first challenge we face that as you have already mentioned that like in the system like United States or, or many places they practice the rule of law we are talking about, the court enjoys the uh, final authority to determine the meanings of the law. But in the Hong Kong system, it is not the court, but the, um, the standing committee, a, a, a political institution in mainland China. Now, in, in 1999, I think the uh, Chinese government might not have a very strong incentive to interfere into the Hong Kong affairs. But as I mentioned, it's the chief executive of Hong Kong who lost in the case, in the, in the case itself, from the back door, went to the standing committee, which might be the higher authority, and uh, get a ruling in his own favor and to overturn the decision of the court. Now, so you can see the rule of law is under challenge in a way that uh, our court can have no final say on the meaning of the constitutional provisions. The standing committee has the power. And also the chief executive himself, who should be the custodian of the Hong Kong's rule of law as the head of the uh, Hong Kong, he should, should protect the autonomy of Hong Kong and the judicial autonomy, the autonomy, overall autonomy, and also the rights of Hong Kong people. But he himself act in a way that uh, hurt the rule of law of Hong Kong. Now, after that decision, the court uh, understood that um, as against the standing committee, actually the court have no authority to question the decision or interpretation by the standing committee. So the court tried to avoid conflict with the standing committee. And we can see in later cases, the court just uh, avoid any possible conflict. And in some way that affected uh, the decisions that we, can, we could get from the court and the rights that can be, uh, we can enjoy in Hong Kong. Now about the second um, event. No, let me just summarize the first. Okay, yes, yeah, right. First okay. episode, two lessons that I draw from it. One mm -hmm. is that the Supreme Court of Hong Kong was clearly subordinated to the National Congress in mainland China. And second, related to that, the only scope that there really was for judicial review, judicial mm -hmm. independence within Hong Kong after that decision was as long as they didn't do something that invoked the, the uh, mm -hmm. 
the intervention of the standing committee or of the, of the national Congress. Yes, right. Is that right? Yeah, okay. right, 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 right. Um, now, so from the event, we can see that the, uh, the first, this first event, that the, the uh, chief executive is not just the judiciary that is important to uh, maintain the rule of law. Many people have a misconception that, well, when we talk about law, a rule of law is the courts, is a business of the court. So the court will have the uh, most important uh, uh, responsibility to maintain the rule of law. But from the event, you can see that there's some limits that the court can do, especially under the situation of Hong Kong. And so the role of the chief executive will also be as important. And our chief executive up to now is not elected by Hong Kong people directly, but elected by a very small electorate. The electoral base will be talking about only um, less than 10% of the population. And, and, and so you can foresee that the, the, the kind of person that will be elected to hold this office of the chief executive. So, um, but according to the basic law that the chief executive should be elected by universal suffrage. And there actually was a timetable in a way in our constitution that the chief executive should be elected by universal, suff universal suffrage in 2007, 2007. So um, uh, after um, the, a big uh, uh, street march in 2003, we have half a million people demonstrating against the chief executive at that time. Uh, Mr. Tung Chi Hua, um, people started to demand that well, we should have a, the chief executive elected according to the basic law by universal suffrage uh, in 2007. But then in 2004, the standing committee made an, an, another decision, an interpretation and decision that um, the election by universal suffrage will have to be postponed and um, um, postponed it twice. And at the end, there was a, seems to be a promise that the chief executive will be elected by universal suffrage in 2017. So that was another decision uh, of the standing committee that has a very significant impact to the development of the uh, rule of law in Hong Kong is through a decision, the election was postponed. Right, so as I understand the second intervention by the um, standing committee, they basically at their own behest um, yes. unilaterally rewrote an important provision of the basic law. Yeah, right, right. In a way, yes, right. right. So again, even, even the words written in the basic law, um, as they were commonly understood, were subject to restatement, reinterpretation, replacement by decisions from the National Congress in mainland China. So in that yep, sense the as well, the basic law can be amended. I think like any constitution, it can be amended, this, yes. but, but that should amendment. be an amendment procedure. But, but uh, that's a procedure mentioned in the basic law itself. But all these decisions or interpretations made by the standing committee um, is, is not, has not gone through that amendment process. It's a, a kind of a black box process. Does the standing committee throw out a, a, an interpretation, a decision, and that's it. That's what we, say the law means and does it. So, you know, so you, you quote um, approvingly uh, from another legal scholar about the rule of law. And I wanna read a paraphrase of what that quotation says. I think it's interesting. It says, and it's related to your point about the importance, it's not just the judiciary that's responsible mm -hmm. for upholding the rule of law. So the scholar says this, for the rule of law to exist, people must believe in and be committed to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. They must see it as a necessary and proper aspect of their society. And this attitude amounts to a shared cultural belief. Mm -hmm. When this belief is pervasive, the rule of law can be resilient. Spanning generations and surviving episodes in which government officials violate the rule of law. When this cultural belief is not pervasive, mm -hmm. the rule of law will be weak or non-existent. And that's kind of part yeah. paraphrase, part quotation. So yeah, I, right. I think this is a perceptive um, statement. Um, but when I think about it in the context of Hong Kong, and I uh, look at developments in recent years and even earlier, it, it looks to me quite clearly that Beijing's intent is to destroy Hong Kong's shared cultural belief in the rule of law, as you defined it earlier. 
-hmm. And I, I see systematic efforts to suppress free speech and independent media, mm -hmm. uh, to control school curricula, mm -hmm. to suppress opposition voices in the Hong Kong legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, there's legal harassment and imprisonment, uh, imprisonment of people like mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the national security law, which further undermines uh, the independence of Hong Kong's judiciary. Mm -hmm. um, the recent decision to postpone legislative elections in Hong Kong, um, mm -hmm. ostensibly out of fear, um, mm -hmm. uh, fear of the pandemic, but in reality, out of fear that the opposition parties might win too many seats. So there was fear, That's but right. very different yeah. kind of fear. And then you know, recently efforts to disqualify legislative opponents. All of those things seem to me to designed to not just uh, corral the rule of law, but to destroy mm -hmm. the cultural foundations of the rule of law mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Is that how you see it? Um, now, I just uh, to further elaborate a little bit about the, the um, um, expression or the quotation you have just mentioned. That is about when we understand the rule of law, many people just talk about the institutional aspects of the rule of law. So we have the separation of powers, you have the checks and balances, judicial independence. There are institutional requirements, even democracy, that we have democratic election. They are only the institutional requirements. But institutional requirements need to be built upon cultural foundations. That is whether the people themselves embrace the values of rule of law. That is what they see the, the, the ultimate purpose of having law. Yes, I would say that the uh, Chinese government and the Hong Kong government, what they are doing now is uh, destroying the institutional aspects of the rule of law. Even our courts, our judicial independence is now under threat. Um, but it might not be easy to destroy or to uh, uh, eradicate the cultural foundation of Hong Kong's rule of law because we have used many years to build up that cultural foundation since the time I studied law at the University of Hong Kong in the, in the mid-80s of the last century. We have been building up this culture of the rule of law. And uh, I find that, uh, ironically, that the more the government has, has done to destroy the institutional aspects of the rule of law. I find a, a stronger commitment to the cultural, the cultural commitments to the rule of law we, we, we embrace in Hong Kong. And from surveys done, um, actually I've just finished an empirical survey on the, I call it the legal culture of Hong Kong people. Actually, I find that the Hong Kong people has a very clear understanding about uh, more than 60% of the population agree that uh, it's a random sampling kind of survey. So it, it may be able to reflect the general uh, sentiment or views of the Hong Kong people, that more than 60% of the people agree that the ultimate purpose of having law in the society is about uh, protecting rights and constraining powers. That's the definition of the rule of law that I've used. Only around 20 to 30% of the population say that rule of law is just about uh, complying with law and just to maintain social order. So you can see that we still have a very strong uh, rule of law culture in the society that uh, we want a rule of law that is not merely about social order. We want a rule of law that's able to constrain powers and, and protecting rights. But the existing situation we are facing now is that the institutional aspects are being uh, 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 under kind of threat and, 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 and in some part of it, like the prosecution, the police power, they are kind of totally tamed, but uh, um, we still have a very strong rule of law culture. So that's an, that's an optimistic uh, set of results from the survey and they're plausible in the light of the, the assault on the rule of law in, in Hong Kong in recent years that people would suddenly say, look, this is something important that we want to, um, we want to preserve and, and hold on to. But at the same time, all that can be true, and it can still be the case that um, one can undermine the foundations of the rule of law, not the institutional foundations, but the, I use the word cultural foundations, maybe that's not the yeah, best right. word. Think about the education process, both mm -hmm. the formal education process that takes place in schools, 
Yeah. An informal process that takes place through media, through conversations, through talking with people freely, and even through protest movements. All of that is being, as I see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. being very much uh, controlled or suppressed in, yep. in a way that, to me, seems like it creates dangers, not so much in the current generation of people in Hong Kong, but for the, yep. the generation of people who are coming up who will follow. They may yep. not have the same appreciation and reverence or respect for the rule of law that mm -hmm. shows up in your current survey results. Yeah, true that um, from cultural studies that we know that um, people kind of develop their, their value systems early in the years of their life. So um, for those people, I think even including the high school students we have now in Hong Kong, we have undergone the, um, the movement in the past few years. I think, I think um, the control of the education system, the, uh, the control of the media will change their value values because the values have already formed in, uh, inside themselves. But for the younger ones, like in the kindergarten, those in the primary schools, now they are introducing uh, changes to the curriculum. So they would be, I would say that uh, um, they are trying to shape, reshape the values of Hong Kong people, especially the younger generation. Now, um, if Hong Kong can maintain freedom of information to a certain extent that we still have access to internet and freely, um, I would say that uh, their work is also not easy. If I'm put in their own position, I will find that if they want to uh, change the values of Hong Kong people would not be easy. I'm always an optimistic person. Um, so our civil society, I think is still very uh, strong and robust and um, we can still continue to advocate our understanding of rule of law in the civil society and um, kind of competing I, I, uh, with the uh, official discourse of the rule of law. So actually I mentioned that the rule of law in Hong Kong now is actually a battle of discourse. The hmm. uh, authorities will put forward their own discourse of the rule of law. That is the kind of uh, authoritarian rule of law we have just talking about. And in the civil society, we can continue to talk about the, the rule of law that we uh, 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 promote. That's the for, for uh, limiting powers and for protecting rights. And um, we'll be in a competition and we might not be having a lot of resources as compared with the government. They have the media, they have the education system, but that does not mean that we have no influence. I think we still can have a chance to maintain the rule of law culture, though it's a difficult battle. Well, that's, that's an insightful way to put it, like the phrase that the competition between discourses. I think that's, I think that um, puts it quite well. Um, Let's go, let's talk about Occupy Central a bit. I mean, again, you, a movement you were uh, deeply involved in. And so when, mm -hmm. when you and, uh, as I understand it, you and others co-founded the Occupy Central with Love and Peace campaign, what, what were you seeking to achieve? What were your goals? Now that's linked with uh, my understanding of the rule of law. As a rule of law scholar, actually, um, I have not been involved in the democratic movement for some time. Um, I was a part of the democratic movement earlier in my student years, but since I joined the university as a faculty member, my main research uh, was on the rule of law. But as I have defined the rule of law that it needs to, powers need to be constrained and not just, I see that not just by the courts. A lot of rule of law scholars limit their attention only to the courts, but I see that from a, from a wider perspective that without a democratic uh, system, even the court will be difficult to maintain its position as already reflected from the events we have mentioned. So I see the uh, democratic election as promised in the basic law as important to the development of rule of law in Hong Kong. Now, I've already mentioned that the uh, standing committee, the Chinese authorities have promised that there might be universal suffrage in 2017. But what exactly is the meaning of universal suffrage? We have learned from the past that they could define anything in any way, even though the term has been mentioned in the basic law, but we have to get a clearer definition of what you mean by universal suffrage. We demand that the universal suffrage should be able to satisfy the international standards. We refer to the uh, uh, General Comment 25 by the uh, Human Rights Committee under the International 
covenant on civil and political rights to understand the, the requirements of uh, uh, universal suffrage. So the Occupy Central was, movement, was, yeah. Was that part of the basic law as it was originally written? That was universal suffrage defined in reference to these United Nations or not? No, uh, it's not expressly uh, defined in this way, just the term universal suffrage, but the International Covenant on Civil Rights is also applicable to Hong Kong under another provision of the basic law. So put it in a parallel, like then they should have a, a, a connection between the meaning of universal suffrage and the International Covenant. So that's what we uh, are expecting that the coming election of the chief executive in 2017 should be able to satisfy by universal suffrage. But um, in order to get um, more support and also to generate more pressure on the Chinese authorities to honor the promise of the basic law and the uh, international covenant. Um, in the past, Hong Kong people or the democratic camp has used the uh, legally allowed methods like organizing uh, protests, public gatherings. Um, but at that time, I believe that it, it might not be important, uh, sufficient. So I, uh, together with uh, my two other colleagues that uh, we co-organized the uh, Occupy Central movement, that we believe that we might have to resort to civil disobedience. And um, that's, I follow the closely the footsteps of uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King of the uh, civil rights movement in the United States, that uh, the way we organize the uh, civil rights movement is a nonviolent movement. And yes, we might break the law, but uh, we are willing to uh, submit ourselves to, the, uh, to all this, the legal responsibilities of breaking the law. And we aim to arouse more concern. And as I've mentioned that the rule of law culture in Hong Kong, and also I refer to the recent survey that I've done. Now, at the time in 2013, we initiate this Occupy Central movement. I, I, not many people really understand what you mean by civil disobedience in Hong Kong. And um, at that time, no uh, systemic survey about the uh, people's attitude towards civil disobedience. After we started the uh, movement, after around 18 months of work um, from survey, we find that around 25% of the population support the, uh, the use of civil disobedience as a way to uh, um, change the system, to make it more just. And um, after a few more years up to now in 2020, when I conduct a survey, similar survey again, 41% of, of the population support civil disobedience. Now, even though the majority is still against civil disobedience, but we have the population 41% of the people supporting the use of civil disobedience. That may also explain why so many people participate in the anti-extradition movement in 2019, because people find that uh, uh, they kind of accept the values of uh, civil disobedience. So if you ask me what has been achieved through this Occupy Central, well, we could not change the system, nothing changed, and the situation is even worse. But I believe that we have uh, changed the uh, culture. The, not only that what we want the rule of law to be, as we, what we have changed is that how we can get what we want is by civil disobedience. So the civil disobedience is now a, a household term in Hong Kong. Everyone knows the meaning of civil disobedience, but just that whether they agree or disagree or whether they will participate directly or only indirectly. That, that's quite interesting. And, and um, so the parallel to the US and you know, the United States, Martin Luther King and others used civil disobedience as a tool to, for black Americans to capture political and legal rights that they were already guaranteed under the constitution but that weren't being honored. Yeah, right. Okay. And, and so you said, look, this, this looks like a device um, within a constitutional system to extend rights, but perhaps also in the case of universal suffrage to be granted rights you were already promised, but weren't being, were yeah, effectively. Right. I yes, see. Right. So that, that's, right. that's quite interesting. I didn't realize that, um, that the US experience with civil rights in the 60s had played such a, an important role in inspiring the civil disobedience campaign in, in Hong Kong. So 
So as I mentioned at the outset in the introduction, you were some years later convicted mm -hmm. of um, being a public nuisance and citing others to pu uh, public nuisance for your events connected to the um, Occupy Central movement in 2014. And you know, tell us about that, you know, your, your conviction. And then I wanna get to your, um, your dismissal from the faculty at, at Hong Kong University. I mean, how do you see, how do you see the, the event both personally, your conviction and, and dismissal, but also how do you, what do you think that the authorities are doing or trying to do in those, no, in, no. in your, your dismissal? Now, as I already mentioned that uh, that is part of the spirit of civil disobedience is to um, accept the legal responsibilities for breaking the law. So I have no regret that I, I got imprisoned, um, even though I find the uh, prosecution as politically motivated, that the prosecution was laid uh, more than three years after the event. And uh, we received the call from the police that uh, you should come to the uh, police station, that we're going to arrest you just the day after the election of the chief executive, Carrie Lam. So I, did, I think they want to avoid the arrest before the election of the chief executive in 2017. And it's very much the timing of it and who were being prosecuted. So you can see the nine of us being prosecuted. They chose people from, from the several political parties, the student leaders and all this. So it's a very, it's a, it's a very, I would say it's a politically motivated prosecution. Um, the trial, I would say is fair, but just that the charges might not be fair, that uh, the uh, offenses, actually the offenses we have committed are not as the serious ones that they are charging us. The, um, the charges are co all common law offenses that's called public nuisance. And um, I, I've referred to uh, writings by scholars that this kind of offense have been used by the prosecution to, uh, to have a, a bigger stake against people. And also if they cannot find things criminal, they will use this public uh, nuisance offense because it can just widely define it. Um, mm -hmm. So the penalty also, I think is too severe. And um, actually from cases uh, in UK, United Kingdom for civil disobedience actions, um, even for public nuisance, that, is, that the punishment should be non-custodian. That's no, no imprisonment. It might be community service orders or something like that. And now it's on appeal. So we will wait and see whether the higher courts will, will decide in favor of us. And, but um, well, the university has already started I the- uh, ask you Before you go on to the university, have, have other persons been charged and convicted under the public nuisance common law in Hong Kong in recent decades? Um, yes, but the, um, but the punishment, not so serious I as the- you remember My next the question, what were the punishments like? It's only uh, 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 fines, fines. Fines, okay. And instead, in, you, in your case, you were sentenced to 16 months. Yes, right, right. So, so this, is, this, this does sound, to my ears at least, like a rather capricious um, uh, sentence, even if you are guilty of, 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 the, of the charge. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, yeah, sorry, I, I must correct myself. It's not fine. It's a suspended sentence. There are, there are several cases on public nuisance. They are on suspended sentence. Yes, yeah, right. And was, was the prosecution required to make a case as to why your sentence should be 16 months instead of a suspended sentence as in previous public nuisance cases? What was, what, was the, what was the proffered reason for why you received such a harsh punishment? 16 months imprisonment is pretty harsh. Yeah, um, in the, in the uh, trial, the prosecution alleged that um, the, there's a, a lot of people being affected by the uh, occupation, 79 days, and that's therefore they, they say that uh, that should be a more serious punishment and the court accepted the, the views and the court did not take account of the civil disobedience. Even the, they have not considered um, the court, court of final appeal decisions in Hong Kong concerning civil disobedience because our court of final appeal has already accepted that civil disobedience is something 
must be considered in the sentencing if the if the offenders um, are accepted to be uh, practicing civil disobedience. So, so that's also one of the grounds of appeal that uh, we are going to see in the coming uh, hearings. So uh, on to your dismissal from the university. Um, and here I think, um, I think it's important for our non-Hong Kong audience that you tell us what the University Governing Council is mm. and who appoints the members of the Governing Council. Because otherwise I think it's, it's hard to understand what happened to you. But, but well, please. Yeah, right. Now the uh, Council of the HKU is a body um, for the, the highest authority in the, uh, the Hong Kong U responsible for governing Hong Kong U. And most of the members, they are appointed by the chief executive, especially the uh, chairperson of the council. And the chairperson of the council also have the power to appoint some members of the council. So in a way that you can see that um, the council is uh, dominated by pro-government people. Yes, we have um, members elected by students and also members elected by uh, academic staff, but they are only the minority in the council. So that's the uh, composition of the council. Now for, for, for the um, dismissal of a tenure staff, according to procedures of HKU, first there will be a fact-finding committee to look at whether there's any wrong done. And if that's a prime official case, then they'll put forward to the Senate. That is say the Senate is the more the academic body. They are the main, the members are all academic persons in the university. And the Senate will make a, a recommendation whether the person should be dismissed on the ground that whether the person is professionally fit to continue the position. And then it will up to the council to make the final decision. So that's the procedure and the, and the different organizations involved. Now the uh, fact finding committee, um, we call it the good cause committee, uh, just state in the report that um, I was convicted by the court and also mentioned that I'm still on appeal. So that's a chance that uh, the conviction can be overturned by higher courts. And the Senate, after hearing uh, my submissions through my lawyers, they find that uh, uh, I'm not professionally unfit to continue the position. So their recommendation is that even though I might have some misconduct, but that's not sufficient for the dismissal. And that's the recommendation they put to the council. But the council overturned the decision of the Senate and, and say that because of, just because of the conviction and the sentence, and I should be dismissed. And um, well, the council chairperson mentioned that if in the future, uh, my conviction was overturned by the higher courts, I may come back to the council again. And it's not clear that whether I will be reemployed by the university or not, are they, will they going to repay my unpaid salary for the past few months? I don't know, but just that the situation is like this. So things that I have to wait until the uh, court's decision to determine my final situation. Are there previous instances in which the university, the governing council of the university has dismissed a tenured professor against the recommendation of the faculty senate? As I can recall, no, as I can recall, no. Though there, there were cases that uh, professors have been dismissed like uh, some of the cases might be uh, criminal convictions, but, but just that sure. I have not seen any case about against the recommendation of the senate. And I just, just to make sure that everybody understands uh, when, when to an American ears, when you, hear, when you hear a term like the governing council, we think about something like a board of trustees mm -hmm. at a university in the United States. The difference here is that the governing council is essentially stacked mm -hmm. with pro-government appointees, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, what, do you draw any broader lessons about academic freedom in Hong Kong from your own experience? Well, now all the universities, I think not all, I think most of the universities in Hong Kong are government funded. And therefore the, the um, we call the chancellor of the university, actually it's a chief executive. The chancellor mm -hmm. is the, 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 you may say the, the uh, in name, the, the, the person leading the whole university. So our president of the university is also the vice chancellor, only the vice chancellor, the chancellor 
is the is the chief executive, and therefore the chief executive also enjoyed the power of appointing people to the council. But for years, the council played a kind of a rather passive monitoring role, just to ensure that the president of the university is getting things done, and and just to ensure things is 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 okay uh, in the governing and the running of the university. Seldom the council interfere with the affairs within Hong Kong, uh, within the University of Hong Kong. But since the time of Occupy Central, the council has already played a much more interventive role in the governing, and not just the council of the uh, HKU, but also the other governing bodies of other universities of Hong Kong. So. The, man, the senior management of, the, of all the universities in Hong Kong now are under close watch by the, their governing body, which is actually all pro-government. And the appointment of the new vice chancellors or the presidents of the universities are in the hand of the governing body. So newly appointed presidents, they are all also people, their minds much more closer to the, to the government. And if you have the senior management of the university, watched closely by the government and acted also closely as the government, so you can, you can foresee that what the academics in the faculties will do. Um, when you apply for funding, you apply for promotion, all of that, people will have to think about again that well, will my, my speech or my writing, my, my publication, cross some red lines. And actually my dismissal in a way is a signal sent to everyone working in the universities in Hong Kong that, well, you better not to do things like Benitai has done that because that has crossed the red lines. And mm -hmm. um, so people will, is a kind of um, a, 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 a um, chilling effect in the universities. There may not be clear instructions what you could do or not to do in your in your work, but just that signals, political signals have been sent through my dismissal. I so I think I played a role in in helping the government to achieve their role to control the uh, academics in Hong Kong. The faculty are presumably smart enough to see uh, your experience and draw a lesson or a message from yes, it. Right. Um, yes, right. And uh, it would be hard. It would be hard to believe that there wasn't a chilling effect yes, on right. that freedom. So, um, Benny, let's 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 turn to questions now, and I'm going to try to pull them up. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if I will. Uh, let, let, let me give me a second to look them over. Okay, sure. Okay, here's a question from Wiley Pun. Uh, isn't it true that the National Standing Committee of the PRC has to act according to the constitution of the PRC? And it is a higher body than Hong Kong, which is a regional government, mm -hmm. where right is given by the basic law that is enacted under the PRC constitution. So obviously the thrust of this question is, um, there's two parts to it. I'd like you to respond to both parts. One is that Hong Kong is subordinate to the standard National Standing Committee of the PRC. But the other part, which strikes me as more interesting, is the claim here that uh, the National Standing Committee of the PRC has to act according to the constitution of the PRC. Um, answer the second question first. Yes, the Standing Committee, in theory, has to act in accordance with the uh, constitution of the People's Republic of China. But the Standing Committee is also the institution authorized by the constitution of the PRC to uh, monitor the application of the constitution itself. So if the Standing Committee is to determine whether the constitution has been complied with, and if it is itself that is contravening the constitution, who can control the standing committee in ensuring it comply with the constitution. So that's no independent body within the constitutional system of China to ensure the standing committee to act in accordance with the constitution, because what the standing committee say to be compared with the constitution will be final. 
So that's the situation in, 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 in so there, there's, China. There's, back to our earlier discussion, there's no separation of powers. That's right. There's no checks and, and balances. And Hong Kong, yes, Hong Kong is a, a special administrative region of China. Um, but under the, uh, the, the constitution and under the uh, basic law, Hong Kong enjoys high degree of autonomy. And there are very clear provisions on how the basic law can be amended. It has to be amended by the National People's Congress, not by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. The Standing Committee has a power to interpret, but actually we find that, actually this is agreed by the Bar Association of Hong Kong that we could not find any provision in the constitution uh, and also the basic law that authorize the standing committee to make decisions that have direct application or constitutional status within Hong Kong. And so all the decisions we have mentioned by the standing committee of postponing the, um, uh, um, the election or disqualifying legislators. There are only so-called decisions of the standing committee, but there's nothing there in the basic law saying that there could be decisions by the standing committee enjoying direct legal or constitutional status in Hong Kong. So yes, we are, you may say subordinate, but we still have to find a legal basis of the standing committee's power and the decision. And, but unfortunately, whether the standing committee has the power or not is defined by the standing committee itself. So it's not under any constraint. So if you say yes, our court cannot question. That's the situation we are facing. Okay, give me a second here to look over the questions again. Okay, here's a very short question from a very different perspective. How does China justify their suppression of rule of law in Hong Kong? This is from San Samuel Voon. Well, ironically, they use rule of law to justify the suppression of the rule of law. Um, we are using a different definition of the rule of law. They use a understanding of rule of law. As I mentioned, the authoritarian rule of law. law um, there are laws, but the main purpose of law is to maintain social order and to protect the national security. And um, things done in the recent years, they have all the protests in the streets, civil disobedience, they are all against the rule of law. So in order to re recover the rule of law they're talking about, they suppress the rule of law we are advocating. Yes, okay, these, okay, then, and here's a related question. This one's from Belinda Lee. What is your point of view on the civil disobedience that turned violent in more recent times? Well, I still um, appear to the pure spirit of the rule of law, uh, sorry, civil disobedience advocated by um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. It has to be nonviolent. Now it's based on the uh, value itself and also it may be also based on a strategic reason because if it's nonviolent, you can uh, um, kind of um, attract more people to uh, support. And, but I see that now the situation of Hong Kong has changed very much. When I talk about uh, civil disobedience in 213 and um, John Rawls in his book, Theories of Justice also talked about civil disobedience. He said that the uh, civil disobedience is something that, uh, that can be used in a near just society. And um, now in 213, I think we are still a near just society, set aside the requirements of uh, John Rawls. But in 219, we are no longer at a near just society. We are at in a authoritarianizing Hong Kong. And though I personally will not use violence, resort to violence. And also I believe that resort to violence might not be uh, strictly right, but I could understand that why people in Hong Kong, some of them resort to violence because they are so angry and they are kind of uh, so unsatisfied with the situation of nonviolence. Um, that's very much similar to the situation of South Africa. I have read the defense of Mandela uh, uh, when he was uh, sentenced to uh, life imprisonment. In his defense, he also mentioned about his change of, a, of a strategy. He also was a supporter of nonviolence in the past. But in 19, 
in the early 1960s, he's changing his approach to violence, but he also limit the, the use of violence. He called it sabotage. It's not about uh, hurting people uh, um, intentionally. It's just to damage property in order to send out political signals. So the violence that even there, there may be violence by some uh, protesters in Hong Kong. They are also kind of the sabotage that's that used by Mandela is just to aim at some objects, damage the property in order to send out political signals that we are angry, we are not set in a situation, we want change. And that is what, how violence has been used in Hong Kong. So I, I personally, I will not support that. I will not do that, but I could understand them why they are doing so. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got multiple, we've got more than one person who's asked a version of this question. This one's from Claudia Rosette. So I'll ask it, how dangerous is it for you to be giving this talk to us and taking these questions? Uh, yes, yes, I fully understand the uh, risk uh, involved. To, um, so you can say that uh, in, in, whole, in my whole speech, I have not mentioned anything uh, about independence, self-determination, all those red lines. And I hope that the freedom of speech will still be protected to a certain extent in Hong Kong. And I'm talking about rule of law in general, the situation of rule of law. Um, all the things I, I uh, uh, mentioned in this uh, uh, um, webinar that I've also written that and published that uh, in Hong Kong, in, in the newspapers in Hong Kong. And up to this point, I'm still safe. I don't know whether there'll be doorbell ringing now that someone will come in and arrest me at this very moment. And uh, I hope that that will not happen. Uh, and, but I still think that it's important to let the world to understand the situation of Hong Kong. And, and I have to protect myself that uh, all I'm saying here now, I've, I'm not inviting anyone, no matter you are from the government, you are from the civil society or individuals to impose sanctions against the Hong Kong government or the Chinese government. I'm just telling you about the situation of Hong Kong. I have made no invitation or request that anyone here hearing to do anything against the interests of the Chinese government or the Hong Kong government. Understood, and th thank you for that answer, Benny. Um, you know, I wanted, uh, before we close up, I wanna give you an opportunity to say a few words about why you chose the hopeful title for your forthcoming article and for today's talk, which is the re rebirth of the rule of law in Hong Kong. Yeah, and thank you. Um, and on that positive note. Yeah, um, as actually in, in, in the um, things I've just I've said in this session, um, I still believe that we have a very strong uh, rule of law culture in Hong Kong. Yes, the rule of law institutions are now under threat and some of them have been uh, damaged or even destructed. Um, but still, we have a very strong rule of law culture. So that will be the basis for the rebirth of the rule of law in the future. Now, not knowing when and not knowing how we can have the rebirth of the rule of law in Hong Kong, I mean the institutions. But uh, if we could maintain the rule of law culture, that Hong Kong people continue to embrace the rule of law values that we mentioned, um, I still believe that um, at some point in the future, when there's some change in the political situation of Hong Kong and China, that uh, the rule of law in Hong Kong may be reborn. And that's also my work as now as an independent scholar on the rule of law in Hong Kong. I will continue my work in the civil society and to conduct rule of law trainings, um, workshops for Hong Kong people um, to help them understand the, uh, the real meaning of the rule of law and also um, organize actions that still peaceful and legal actions that can uh, uh, continue our, our struggle for the rule of law in Hong Kong in the future, hoping that one day we'll be able to see the rebirth. Thank you, Benny, and uh, I, I share that hope. 
Um, so let, let's wrap it up. I want to thank you so much, Benny. This has been uh, very uh, insightful and inspiring. Uh, really appreciate your time and, uh, and your courage in, uh, speaking to, in speaking to us today. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Stigler Center for uh, hosting this event. Uh, thanks, Sebastian, for introducing us and uh, the staff at the Stigler Center. There's a lot of work that goes on uh, behind the scenes to make this event happen. Um, and I just want to thank everybody so much. And uh, Benny, uh, you take care and uh, good luck in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you.